We send people to space for a, for a variety of reasons, and they range from gathering of scientific information, everything from how the body reacts to the environment of space, to in the case of the Apollo missions, actually doing science on the surface of the moon. But also, we send humans to space to explore. We send humans to space because of a more primeval human nature thing of going out and exploring with humans. Also, when astronauts go out, there's only a few of them, but they're acting as surrogates for, for everyone else and going out there and exploring the, the unknown. They were thinking correctly in the film in that um, there would be a length of time that would pass, which would be non-trivial. In this case, it was 18 months. And so they had to design life support systems that would be able to accommodate individuals. And if you think about it, if you had to sustain somebody for 18 months, that would be a huge amount of food, if nothing else, oxygen, you know, something to run the energy with. So they put the astronauts into a form of stasis or sleep, if you will, over a long period of time. So therefore, their body rates of consumable is very, very low. A popular idea for future space travel is there is some kind of state of suspended animation that you stick the astronauts in a box and they go into a mellow sleep and they wake up a thousand years later someplace very different. But funny things happen to objects in space. There have been well-documented facts about what happens to the bone structure in zero gravity. Essentially, it begins to break down. The bone density actually begins to get smaller, lower bone density. So for long durations, uh, at least in some of the astronauts that have seen it when they come back to Earth, they have to take it easy because essentially you don't have gravity to help build up the muscles to help keep the joints together. And at the same time, the density in the bone itself is actually beginning to lower itself. So how do you try to counter that? One way is with exercise, and so astronauts typically exercise a lot, especially on long duration missions, but it's still quite a challenge. And the other thought is, in all the traditional propulsion that we have now, or even some of the advanced propulsion, like ion propulsion or nuclear propulsion, where you'd have a nuclear device up there that was spitting atoms out at very high velocities that would then accelerate you, no matter what you talk about, you need propellant. You need something to make that happen, just like gasoline in a car. Either one of those, unfortunately, are very difficult to get to close to the speed of light, which you would need to cross these great vast distances without having huge stores of the propellant. And, and we're talking amount of propellant that doesn't currently exist, unfortunately. So a spacecraft to be able to do what was done, at least in the Planet of the Apes, we, we, haven't, we haven't come up with yet. Well, landing on a planet with a spacecraft is not easy. And if you're not careful, it's gonna go splat because it approaches the planet very rapidly. So it somehow has to lose that speed either in orbit or in the final phase. And then as you get into the atmosphere itself, if it has an atmosphere, then you can use the atmospheric pressure on the spacecraft itself as a braking. Density of the air rushing past at very fast speed causes heat. And so you have to get rid of the heat somehow. They have to go through a fiery descent and they have to have a heat shield that can protect them as they get rid of their speed and energy. The technology associated with the shuttle actually has these foam tiles. That would reject the heat coming into the atmosphere. And then once you come into the atmosphere, the notion is, at least in the movie as well as the shuttle, uses a, a gliding system that gives you the control authority to be able to move and maneuver to different locations so you could pick your landing spot and therefore you go toward it. If any of those landing systems fail, building a spaceship that's able to withstand a very hard impact is very tough to do. I remember in the movie that the, the ship came down and was essentially whole. It, it'd be tough to see that that would actually happen. Well, a popular theme in, in movies and books is uh, colonizing Mars or colonizing another planet. And so a question that can be reasonably asked is how practical is that? Is there much hope of doing it? And basically Mars is an impoverished planet. So you'd have a long ways to go to take that and convert it into one that we could live in. The logistics involved in, in colonizing even a place as quote unquote close as the moon or our, our next nearest and more similar neighbor Mars 
are uh, enormous, <laughs> hard to comprehend, and, and I don't think anyone's worked out fully all of them. You have to create a survivable environment first. You obviously have no food, you have no water, uh, you have a high radiation environment, you have micrometeorite impacts that are occurring. You have to have shielding for these things, you have to bring or create all of your oxygen. You, you not only need this, but you need whole infrastructures with your communications back to Earth. Uh, navigation, getting there and around the site, being able to deal with the huge temperature extremes. So the Apollo astronauts went only during the, the lunar day, daytime, but during the lunar night it's 400 degrees colder. So you have to engineer for both extreme heat and extreme cold, and you have to deal with things in both places like lots and lots of dust and little particles that are quite the problem for any type of mechanical device. So it's a huge list of, of challenges, uh, not to mention just the transportation getting to and from, which is one of your, your biggest challenges right off the bat. You have to think about the biological effects that you have to consider that. So they're talking about the shelter associated with uh, the astronauts up there, uh, what can they eat, what really is the long duration effects, because now we're talking about months if not years in that environment versus our only our months or you know shorter time period in in space uh, or around the earth so that may have some effects they haven't thought about mars is a higher gravity so it wouldn't be quite as bad of an effect associated with the individuals um, but it uh, it's uncertain whether there's water ice there you know the same issues apply in the distant future when we're going to other stars and things like that, then we may find some planets and say, hey, that's a pretty nice looking planet. You know, it's green, it's got a lot of water in it. Short of those kinds of precursors, I don't see any of this stuff happening. I mean, we, we live on a very good planet for us, and our job is to keep it livable and to keep our relationships harmonious. Time dilation is a very subtle physical concept that we can't really test yet. The concept is that the fabric of space, of space-time, is actually distorted as an object moves faster and faster and faster in the universe. And one way it's distorted is in dilating in the direction that it's moving very fast. So as you go faster as an individual or an object goes faster itself, time slows down relative to an observer outside. And so this is how you can have an effect like in Planet of the Apes, where the group who's moving, if they're moving really, really fast, then 18 months of time can pass for them, whereas it may be hundreds of years for people remaining on Earth. How do we know what other planets are made of since we've not visited very many of them, even with robots? A lot of the information we have comes from the light that's reflected, the light of the sun or the light of the central star of these planetary systems because it picks up a signature on it as it's reflected. For, for example, when sunlight hits the Earth and is reflected out to space where there must be aliens observing us and trying to figure out what's going on, they'd see a lot of CO2, carbon dioxide. They would see, more importantly, the, um, the spectral reflectance of green, which is chlorophyll, stuff that makes the grass green. They'd say, that's interesting, that's, that must be living. That, that stuff can't live without dirt and water and air and CO2 and so forth. They might even see um, gases in the atmosphere which don't belong there, pollutants. So yes, that's, that's how it would do. It would be built up by inferences like that. A light year is the distance that a light wave, a photon, travels in one year. And it's useful only as a measure of interstellar distances. A light year is at roughly equivalent to about six with 12 zeros behind it of miles in distance. It was a construct brought up to try to bring some reasoning to the great distances that are out there. Our galaxy is about 100,000 light years across. So from one edge to the other would take light 100,000 years to go across. We're about 26,000 light years from the center of our galaxy, out in one of the spiral arms. The Earth to Sun distance in light years is actually better measured in light minutes. It's about eight light minutes, so it takes about eight minutes for light to get from the sun to us, or when you look up and see the sun, you're actually seeing the sun eight minutes ago.
I believe in the movie, they travel light years in order to get to another location and come back, which then gives you the distance that you need in order to travel at the speed of light, which gives you the time that they would expend uh, between 18 months on board versus 2,000 years at home. Well, people might wonder what the Earth would look like in 2,000 years. And one answer, well, let's consider how it looked 2,000 years ago. And of course, it looked very different in terms of cities and peoples, and agriculture, smog, and all the rest. More generally, you can't predict what human technology and living patterns are going to change. Look how much they've changed in 100 years. And they were misforecasted 100 years ago. So I think we have to accept the fact that the future is relatively unknowable, partly because the human capabilities are so large, and especially of technology, and there are natural events going on as well. So absent human activities directly and absent any catastrophic events going on the Earth, it that shouldn't change very much. SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, is looking for signals from intelligent alien civilizations. You can do it in a number of different ways. The most common has been to look at radio signals, and uh, as, as yet, we've found nothing. We also now, including at the Planetary Society, are, are funding activities using optical SETI searches. So you look for basically laser pulses from other civilizations. And it turns out that with even Earth technology now, if we wanted to, we could outshine the sun for a split second by more than a factor of 10,000. So we're just starting more and more searches to look for potential optical signals. Uh, nothing's been found. There's no evidence whatsoever. On the other hand, it's a gigantic haystack that you're looking for a needle in. And so despite decades of little searching here and a little searching there, you have to look through all of space, you have to look through all these different frequencies, you don't know how they'll be communicating, you have to be looking in the right place at the right time. It's a, a non-trivial task, but one that uh, if, if you ever succeeded would clearly have incredibly profound uh, effects on humans and the way we view the universe. People have always wondered, do we have neighbors? Are there other people like us or other intelligent species out there? There are a lot of planets in the universe. There are a lot of planets that are comparable in age to our own. There are probably lots of planets that have some atmospheric gases similar to our own. But we can't say that, that there's a lot of planets that have life. We don't know that. We have only one example here. This little planet Earth has this extraordinary phenomenon on it. Is it rare or is it common in the universe? We don't know. It's very hard to predict the path that evolution will take. People ask me all the time, are we still evolving? And the answer is emphatically yes, we're still evolving. We're not necessarily losing our little toe or any of those anatomical things you look for, but we're certainly evolving on a microscopic level. Uh, we, we adapt constantly to the threat of diseases. When these emerging viruses pop up, whether it's HIV or Ebola or anthrax, uh, we have to respond to those. Some people will survive them, some people won't. That's natural selection in part. So the idea that humans could evolve a trait sometime in the distant future, like being mute, as people are in, in Planet of the Apes, is um, you know, it's a fantasy, but if there were some evolutionary pressure that was significant enough that being mute was advantageous, then yes, it could evolve. Or under some scenarios, if being mute were connected to some mutation that was harmful, and that popped up and spread for some reason, then at least in theory that could happen. What well, evolution is a natural process that, as far as we know, governs uh, Earth and perhaps the universe. It's the way that life changes. It's the way that one species morphs into another. And it's the principle that guides life on Earth and has, as far as we know, for billions of years. Charles Darwin lived in the 1800s, and the idea at the time was that God created man in his own image and all the other plants and animals in an array of types in order to inspire man's awe and devotion. And Darwin looked around and he started to suspect that rather than God creating kind of permanent and immutable categories of plants and animals, that instead there was one original ancestral species and from that it radiated out to fill a number of different niches and um, changed through time in response to changes in the environment. So if you have um, a group of animals that are under some severe environmental pressure, uh, for instance, finches in the Galapagos are a classic example that have been studied for many decades. 
Uh, finches have bills. They use these bills for cracking open seeds. And although you might think that these bills might change shape through natural selection over thousands of generations, it's been shown that it may take as little as a decade. And you have finches that visibly change shape by a few millimeters. And those larger bills enable them to crack open seeds that enable them to survive droughts that they wouldn't otherwise be able to survive. Planet of the Apes is a wonderful fantasy in which apes have taken over the world. But as intelligent as they are, and as intelligent as they might become in the future, they wouldn't necessarily become human. They might develop better technologies. They might be able to become more socially complex in the way their society works. They wouldn't make them human. It might make them more highly advanced and highly adapted apes. It's kind of like asking the question, wouldn't it be great if humans had wings? I mean, if we had wings, we could do all kinds of things we can't do today. But we can't predict whether, I mean, it's conceivable that in uh, 10 million years, humans could have the beginnings of wings, but one can't predict that. And so there's no logical reason to predict that apes would ever evolve into humans, although they might well evolve into uh, a more highly intelligent, more technologically savvy creature than they are today. Right now, apes are incapable of producing spoken speech because of the way that they're vocal tract is arranged. The reason apes can't speak is they just don't have the, they don't have the mechanics right here. The palate, the tongue, they're not, they're not structured the way ours are. So there have been old studies in which chimps learn to speak using only vowel sounds, but they can't make the consonant sounds. Their lips and their tongue just can't do that. Of course it's possible in the future that apes could develop speech if there were selective pressure for making vowel sounds and individuals and groups of apes who could make vowel sounds had a competitive advantage over those who couldn't, then that would be a good indication that perhaps future generations would have enhanced abilities to produce the kinds of sounds that are needed for speech because that's preferred or that's a good adaptation to have in particular environments. Humans and great apes are extraordinarily similar genetically. In fact, now as we begin to map the human genome, and we're also mapping the chimpanzee genome, what we're finding is the number of differences that are functional differences seem to be extraordinarily small. If we want to ask the question, how recently did we share a common ancestor with the other apes, our closest living relatives are chimpanzees and bonobos, and we shared a common ancestor with both of those species five million years ago and with gorillas about eight million years ago, and with the Asian apes um, before eight million years ago. Well, it's very hard to look at a great ape, let's say a chimpanzee, and not think of humans. They are cognitively, intellectually, so much like us. I mean, they are so much like being with a human toddler in some ways. That's about where the level of their intellect is. So the question is, how did humans evolve? And that also involves the question of what constitutes a human. The most dramatic difference between an ape and a human is that we stand upright. And that really was uh, the earliest change in our ancestors, that we became upright, two-legged walkers, bipeds, and apes remained quadrupeds, four-legged walkers. We share many, many traits. We share far more traits than we differ on. We share the opposable thumb, the grasping hand that all primates have. Uh, we share a relatively big brain. We share exactly the same skeleton. And our, our, some of our bones are oriented differently, but our, the bones themselves are the same. Even in our own evolution, um, we lived as recently as 30,000 years ago alongside Neanderthals, who were so similar to us that not only were they in our genus, the genus Homo, but they were also the same species as us. They were Homo sapiens. They were just a different subspecies. There's no way to predict the direction that evolution would take. And there's no reason at all to think that if you gave apes another million years or 10 million years, they would evolve into anything resembling humans. Apes are apes. They've evolved a set of specialties and adaptations to their environment that enable them to survive and reproduce. That's taken millions of years. And they've gone on their own path. And humans and our direct ancestors have gone on our own path. So the whole scenario in Planet of the Apes, in which apes have taken over the world, doesn't necessarily mean that they've evolved from people. It might be that they were apes and there were humans in the distant past, and that over time the apes went in a different evolutionary direction than the humans did. 
One of the fascinating parts of Planet of the Apes for me is the theme of animal rights. It really, by taking humans and treating them in the way that we treat apes, I think would make people more sympathetic to the plight of apes in zoos and apes in labs. So for instance, that you would just arbitrarily decide one morning to geld a particular male. You know, that really is driven home when it's happening to a human that you can identify with, or when you perform a lobotomy on a particular individual, or you just throw some random female into the cage and think that, you know, you're going to produce offspring that way and that it's all about you and your scientific experiment. And I think by turning that around and having the apes do it to humans, it really had an impact on people and um, is great in terms of increasing sensitivity to the rights of other animals. Well, there are four great apes, chimpanzee, bonobo, gorilla, orangutan. Each one is a very different society. Chimpanzees live in a society that we call fission fusion. They don't live in groups. They don't live in any cohesive social unit the way we might think of it. They live in what we call a community. The community has highly defended territorial boundaries. They will kill intruders, not for meat, not for food, but simply because they're being territorial. Um, they live in a society in which males form the nucleus and females, as they grow up and go through puberty, migrate to other communities. So it's a very much a male-centered uh, society. Bonobos live in a society in which females have much more power. Females form alliances, they form coalitions that suppress males, that protect themselves against male aggression. That never happens in female, among female chimps. Gorillas are a big, powerful animals, not quite as cognitively skilled, at least in the wild, as chimps. Gorillas in the wild don't use tools. They don't form complex societies in the way that chimps do. Gorillas uh, tend to live in a harem-type social structure where there's a big silverback male and he controls access to a number of females who associate with him. And usually he sires all of the offspring then in that group. If the females, they don't like the male they're living with, if they're prone to migrate to another group where there's another eager male happy to have the female entering. Orangutans are real enigmas for scientists. They don't live in complicated societies. They live in dense, remote rainforests alone or in very, very small groups. It takes a long time to compile information about them. We, we thought at one time that they were utterly solitary. What we know now is that it's dependent on food supply. And when food is very abundant, you'll get gatherings of several. When the fruit is all ripening at once, suddenly all the orangs start becoming social and hanging out with each other and interacting. So clearly in the past they had a more social existence and it's just something about how food is distributed today that's making them appear to be less social. In the wild, chimps have a very rich repertoire of gestures. They have a gesture for begging that looks just like our gesture for begging. They also have a rich repertoire of sounds they make that they use to indicate everything from anger to fear to a desire, dominance, and so forth. And we call that their communication system or their language. Apes that are raised in human settings, as a number of experimentally raised apes have been over the years, will develop uh, human speech in the sense that they will learn to not speak, but they'll learn to use sign language, they'll learn to use an electronic symbol board to communicate, and we know that they can develop speech to about the level that a human toddler would, which is quite profound when you think about it, because we put them in zoos, and we put them in laboratories, which we would never think to do with a human child, and yet their intellects are simply not that different. There are research projects in which chimps are allowed to uh, spontaneously communicate with each other using the sign language that they've learned from researchers over the years. And and then video cameras, which are simply secretly remotely uh, taping what the animals do, will show what they're actually saying to one another. And they do have conversations, simple conversations, but they will speak in two-word sentences, three-word sentences. And if that doesn't sound impressive, think about what your own child does when they're one and a half or two years old and they want something. A child can get almost everything it needs in life by using two-word sentences or three-word sentences. And a chimp is able to do pretty much the same thing. The Planet of the Apes is a wonderful fantasy in which apes have taken over the world. And I would like to see apes take over the world in the sense that I wish there were more of them around because humans have driven them to the brink of extinction. But as intelligent as apes are, and as intelligent as they might become in the future, they wouldn't necessarily become human. Apes do things using their big brains that are fascinating. They use technology, they make and use tools to get food. They are able to understand complex social networks the way that we are. I mean, they're very political animals the way that we're very political, but in their own way and not really in a way that 
is human and not in a way that would ever evolve into being human. Franz Duval did an experiment once where he was burying fruit in the enclosure of captive chimpanzees and leaving it just a tiny bit exposed. And the chimps knew this routine, and they would run all around the enclosure when they were let out looking for the buried fruit. But there was a day when nobody found the fruit. And after a while, they all gave up. And in the afternoon, when everybody kind of started sleeping, one of the young, low-ranking males sat bolt upright, got up, made a beeline to exactly where the fruit had been buried, and dug it up and ate it silently. Well, if he would have shown in the morning that he knew where this fruit was, it would have been taken away from him. He was low-ranking. So it showed a kind of deception that chimps are really good at. A high-ranking chimp, a dominant male chimp, let's say, is high-ranking not because he's big and brawny and powerful physically, but because he's intellectually powerful. So we have many examples over the years, uh, beginning with Jane Goodall's observations continuing to the present, of chimpanzees who rose in rank to become the top-ranking alpha male who did so because they were clever. I mean, really, the analogy with politicians is impossible to resist, that a high-ranking, successful male chimp is really, really good at manipulating those around him and getting them to do what he wants them to do in exactly the same way that a politician uh, is clever and has to be in order to survive as a politician. It's possible that apes feel some kind of sense of spirituality. Jane Goodall described how when chimps approach waterfalls, they go into a special kind of dance where they hoot and they dance around and they drum on things, and it's a behavior that they only show around these waterfalls. I wouldn't say they're spiritual, but they certainly have a, a sense that nature out there is, is, is fascinating in the same way that we would. One bonobo researcher suggested that perhaps bonobos have a taboo against eating something that's closely related to them. So those kinds of ideas that you might have ethics about what you eat and what you won't eat, or that you rever certain kinds of events that are happening in nature, I think would be the precursors towards something that would lead towards spirituality. Uh, when you look at a chimp who's asleep at night, chimps build nests that are big bowls of leaves in the top of a tree, and they're very comfortable. And when the chimp is in its bed, lying on its back, often with its um, arm crossed behind its head, looking up at the stars, it's very much what we would do if we're out camping, and you just can't help but wonder what he's thinking about. If he's pondering life, if he's wondering what kind of a day it was today and what kind of a day it'll be tomorrow. Well, th there are about 250 to 300 primate species. One of those is us. We are a primate species. And there are four great apes, which are our closest kin. Those are the chimpanzee, the gorilla, the bonobo, the orangutan. We talk about the great apes as being a unique cluster evolutionarily. They share a number of traits, a big brain, a rotating shoulder. I mean, the same shoulder that a quarterback uses or a pitcher uses to throw a fastball is inherited from our ape ancestors. That was an ape adaptation to hanging in trees and feeding in trees. There was a fork in the road about six million years ago. And at that fork, humans branched off from the other apes. At that time, six million years ago, we were very much like an ape. And then over time, over the past few million years, we have seen a succession of very primitive kinds of humans. Some of them were very ape-like. The famous fossil Lucy, which was an Australopithecine, followed by creatures like Homo erectus, which was a couple of million years ago, much more modern, much more human-looking, and then nearly fully modern people like Neanderthals and Cro-Magnon, which lived only in the past tens of thousands of years. And that really was uh, the earliest change in our ancestors, that we became upright, two-legged walkers, bipeds, and apes remained quadrupeds, four-legged walkers. At the same time, we evolved bigger brains, and over time, our brains became bigger and bigger. A popular perception, particularly here in America, is that it might be possible for a species to de-evolve, meaning that you've reached some kind of point of success, and then something causes a turnaround where you go back into a more primitive state. That whole concept has um, serious flaws in it because evolution is not unidirectional and it's not goal-oriented. It's not taking you to a path where at some point you will have achieved what nature wants you to have achieved. So if it's good in one season to have a shallow beak and three seasons later it's good to have a deep beak and three seasons after that it's good to have shallow beaks, you'll see that fluctuation going back and forth. So it's only in our minds that we like to think that, you know, um, a non-grasping foot that we have for bipedal walking is somehow an improvement over the grasping foot of, say, a chimpanzee. 
but that's all just very subjective. What's better, a grasping foot or a non-grasping foot? Or locomoting through the trees or locomoting on the ground? There really is no hierarchy like that. And so in terms of devolution, it's really not a valid concept because there is no sort of better and worse. Natural selection is Darwin's greatest idea. It started with the question that he asked himself about how new species could possibly come into being. And it's based upon four postulates. So his first postulate was that there's an overproduction of individuals, not all of whom will survive. His second postulate was that within a population, individuals will vary in how well adapted they are to the current circumstance. So um, if we're both living in Australia and your background is aborigine, you're going to be better suited to the amount of sunlight in that environment than I would be if I came from Northern England. His third postulate was that part of variation is heritable, meaning that some of the traits that I have are the result of the traits that my parents passed on to me. And then his fourth postulate was that um, variation is not random, that um, the individuals who survive the most and reproduce the most are the best adapted to the environment that they're living in at that time. Natural selection is a process by which more fit forms, favorable forms, traits, are favored over less favorable traits, so that an animal that is a bit smarter than its neighbor is more likely to survive and reproduce and leave offspring than its neighbor. And that process, writ large over thousands or millions of years, uh, is what we call evolution by natural selection. Clearly, humans have evolved in terms of the change that we've undergone in our anatomy and who we are, we've undergone dramatic changes in a much shorter time period than many other species have. One common misperception about evolution is that when you need something, it evolves. But evolution doesn't respond to need, it responds to what's already happened. If suddenly darker skin color is beneficial because the ozone layer is gone, then individuals who already have dark skin are going to be the ones with the advantage and they're going to leave more genes. It's not as though suddenly nature says, oh, let's produce more individuals with dark skin. Evolution is historical. We look back, we try to explain what's already happened, and we have no idea whether it will ever happen again. Evolution responds to the variation that's already there. So it's possible that apes could evolve spo spoken language, but it would depend upon what kind of variation is present in the population in terms of their ability to produce anything like a sound. Well, chimps could, could evolve a full-blown language if there were a really strong natural selection pressure for it but there's no reason to think that they would. You know, we have a tendency to think of chimpanzees as under-evolved people, and we have, a, we have an unfortunate tendency to see ourselves as the pinnacle, and chimpanzees somewhere on a rung below us on the same ladder, and that's a completely wrong way of looking at evolution. The proper way to look at it is that the evolution of life on Earth and of primates is a branching bush, we're on one branch, chimps and bonobos are on a different branch, but we've all evolved for the same number of millions of years. It's just that the outcome has been different, the species are different. If we were all clones, we would all sink or swim together. We'd all be well adapted or not adapted to the environment. But because each of us has a lot of variation and in each generation mutations occur, you never know what's going to be a good new variant that's going to be a better fit. There are some classic examples of genetic mutations that have led to adaptations in humans. So one would be um, sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia is a bad disease. If you, if you have it, then you're unlikely to make it to reproductive age. You usually die in childhood or adolescence. So you would think natural selection would have weeded out the gene. That's what natural selection does. It favors the more successful variants. And yet, the gene persists um, in particular populations in the world. Well, it turns out that the mutation that caused sickle cell anemia, which makes your red blood cells sickle-shaped instead of round and puffy like little donuts, is adaptive if it's an environment where malaria is present. So in the presence of the malarial parasite, it's good to have red blood cells that are sickle-shaped because as they collapse and take on that shape, they release potassium, which kills the malarial parasite. And so the gene is maintained because it actually has an adaptive advantage in some environments. There are many examples like that. For many people, it seems as though mutation is a negative. But in fact, mutation is what creates variation in a population. And so ultimately, it's a really good thing because that's kind of the raw ingredient that natural selection needs so that there's something to select between. 
think it's unlikely that apes would take over if man were suddenly absent. But I think the world in many ways would be a happier place for the other species. We are really the first species to have such an enormous impact on so much of the biodiversity on the planet. In today's world, apes have very little opportunity to take over the world because we've driven them into the absolute smallest corners of existence and we're continuing to hunt them out of existence and take away their habitat. If tomorrow there were no people, then at the very least, there would be abundant opportunity for apes to take over many of those niches again. And it might take millions of years, but and it might not happen ever, but it could happen, simply because the opportunity would be there. And we can't predict then what new adaptations might arise in those apes when they invaded and took over the habitats that were no longer available to them in our presence. In the wild, you typically wouldn't see a lot of interspecies interaction. That doesn't mean that it never happens, and in certain species of primate, there are hybrid zones where, for instance, two different species of baboons will hybridize, and the hybrids act like the species they most resemble. So there's interaction between different so-called species, but not between really so much different types of ape. In the African apes, bonobos and chimps are separated by the Congo River, so it's kind of an impenetrable barrier for them, so they wouldn't ever encounter each other in the wild. But in captivity, they readily mate with each other when they have the opportunity. In the wild, apes tend to ignore each other, or at worst, they'll see each other as competitors for food, and so they really won't uh, get together. I mean, among themselves, within one species, there's, of course, a lot of positive relationship that goes on. But between species, uh, it would tend to be mostly animosity because they would see the other species as a potential competitor. In one of the few forests where chimps and mountain gorillas live together, we found that they tended to avoid one another. And when they ended up in the same tree together, uh, they either were oblivious to one another or the chimps would dominate the gorillas and chase them out of the trees and basically just scare them half to death. So apes and other species of apes tend to have minimal relationship with one another in the wild. We are one species in the group of mammals, of which there are 4,000. We are one type of primate, of which there are 200. We are one species in the genus Homo. We haven't been around very long, depending on what you want to count as human, let's say something on the order of five to three and a half million years ago we originated. We might not be around much longer given how we're exploiting the Earth. So we're not very important in the grand scheme of things. We tend to think of evolution as somehow reaching a pinnacle with us, but in fact we're just one random point on a wide kind of scattershot array on a graph where in the long run we're not going to be that significant. Screenwriters and others have speculated on what the Earth would look like if there were some nuclear war or massive nuclear explosion. And the answer is, it, as seen from space or by aliens, not very different. The most significant face-altering aspect are asteroids that impact us, like meteor craters, a small one, there are bigger ones that happened in the past. Those are the ones that have actually shaped the Earth's surface. So I don't think that the human activities of that type would be very significant. If you have a nuclear explosion or, or even many, a full-out nuclear exchange, uh, it's going to make life potentially very bad for humans. Earth itself isn't going to notice it very much except for the atmosphere. So you're not going to have changes in rotation and you're not going to influence the earthquakes happening or the plates moving around. Uh, what you will do, especially with a big nuclear exchange, is you may kick up a lot of dust into the atmosphere, a lot of other particulates f uh, from the explosion in the atmosphere, which may start forming clouds. And then you may get what's been termed a, a nuclear winter, a similar effect to what you might get from a very large uh, meteorite impact uh, into the Earth, where you actually cool the temperature all over the Earth and you cut out light and you make it hard for plants to live and therefore hard to an for animals to live. If you're lucky enough, that your nuclear exchange is much smaller, then you have much more regional and localized effects as opposed to, to global.